I'm Craig Payne, a senior lecturer in the Department of Podiatry um, at La Trobe University. What I'm going to do in this video is go through our um, biomechanical assessment form, um, how we would teach it to the students, and people can take from it whatever they want or sections that they want to do what they would like to do in your own clinical practice. Um, when a patient comes in as part of the normal history and physical, at some stage of that we're going to have to make a decision that this is a biomechanical um, case that needs a further assessment or they may or may not need orthoses. So the, the process we're going to go through um, is what we're going to cover in this video. At some stage of the assessment there'll be something in the history that'll indicate this is biomechanical dysfunction. In that case we then expect the students to go and get this form um, and then start working their way through that. The, the, the whole first page of this form is really to help determine is, is this really a biomechanical dysfunction that needs further assessment or not. The first thing that, that's needed on this form at the top here is the presenting complaint. You know, what have they come in for? What's their main concern? Also on this part of, for, part of the form, you know, we need to elicit activity levels, um, what sports they were taking in, anything else that might be contributing to the um, cause of the symptoms they've got. You know, are they standing at work, sitting at work? and then looking at footwear patterns and elic eliciting from them any other symptoms. At the bottom of this first page is a, is a space called summary impressions at this stage. The whole point being is to stop and ask yourself, is this really mechanical in origin or is it not? Obviously if any symptoms indicating pain at night indicate it may be a neurological one and not, and not biomechanical. After we have decided that this possibly is a mechanical problem, the, the very next thing to do is just to get people standing and to observe if there's any abnormal alignment. To help, to help us in that process, we tend to use the foot posture index because what the foot posture index does, it breaks down the position of the, or the alignment of their foot into a number of parameters that we can encourage the students to observe. So from behind, we're going to observe things like the curvature above and below the lateral malleolus. We'd expect that to be about equal. We want to look at helping sign. Is there any bowing in the Achilles tendon or is it straight? We want to look at the calcaneus. Is it vertical, is it inverted or is it an everted? We're also going to want to look at the lateral border of the foot. Is it straight, is it slightly abducted or is it adducted? And we also want to look at the forefoot on the rear foot. Is the forefoot in line with the rear foot? Is it abducted or adducted? Here we can see the lateral border not quite being straight and the forefoot slightly abducted and in indicating that this foot's slightly pronated. Again, we can see a calcaneus that's possibly vertical or slightly everted. Now let's get you to turn around and face the other way. F from the front, the observations we want to make is you know, palpate the tailless head. Is it, is it equally prominent on both sides or is it more prominent on the medial or lateral sides? In this case here, it's slightly more prominent on the medial side, indicating the foot is pronated slightly. We're also going to want to observe the arch height. Does it look normal? Does it look high or does it look flat? We also want to look at the prominence of the foot in the talonavicular region. You know, is, is it prominent? Is it not prominent or is it almost um, concave in that area. Once we've made all these eight observations and scored them ranging from negative two to supinated to plus two as a pronated foot, we want to add them all up together. We generally assume a score of zero to four is within the normal range. Four to ten is mildly pronated. Anything above ten is um, more severely pronated with 16 being the maximum. Anything that is negative would indicate a supinated foot. How pronated or supinated the foot is may or may not have implications for orthosis prescribing you know, when that decision making process is arrived at. Okay, once we've completed the assessment of the standing foot posture, we then need to move on to the gait analysis. The sole purpose of the gait analysis is really to try and determine if there's any abnormal function present that could explain the symptoms that we're diagnosed on page one of the assessment form. So what we're going to look at is starting at top to bottom, observing the head and the eyes. Is the head straight or tilted to one side? Looking at the shoulders, is one lower than the other? Or then looking at arm swing, is there even arm swing on both sides? 
is the hands or the arms falling outwards from the body more on one side versus the other side. Moving down and looking at the pelvis, is really tilting to one side or the other. Moving further down, observe the patella. Is there any internal or external position of the knee? Where is the rear foot at mid stance? Where is the rear foot during propulsion? As they come forward, you know, what's the talonavicular region doing? Is it bulging medially? What is the base of gait? Is there a wide base of gait or a narrow base of gait? What is the angle of the gait? Is the, is the angle straight or is it abducted or adducted? And finally, anything else we might want to observe. Is there anything like an abductory twist or anything else abnormal that might explain the symptoms that you're seeing on page one? So now that we've done the gait analysis and decided there is some abnormal function present that might be contributing to the symptoms that we discussed on page one, we, we now need to go ahead and decide what is causing that abnormal function that was causing those symptoms. So we're going to do a prone, supine and weight wearing assessment looking for the contributing factors. The first part is the prone assessment. And we're going to need to consider um, the subtalar joint range of motion. And again, we'd normally expect that there would be 10 degrees of eversion and 20 degrees of inversion, but there's substantial variability in the population, um, especially in the range of um, eversion. So generally we want to see more inversion than eversion, and at least a normal range of motion for um, everyday function, and even a greater range of motion for sporting activity. The subtalar joint neutral position, we're going to palpate the heads of the talus on the medial and lateral sides and invert and evert the foot until they are both um, equally, equally palpable on both sides. And in that position, when we dorsiflex the lateral side of the forefoot, we want to just generally look at the alignment of the heel to the alignment of the leg and generally expect them to be in line or slightly inverted. The next test we're going to look at is the position of the subtalar joint axis, which has a huge influence on how people function and orthoses prescribing. Um, if we push medial to the joint axis, the foot is going to invert. If we push lateral to the axis, the foot is going to evert. So at some point, there's got to be no inversion and eversion happening. So we're going to want to mark that spot. We assume that that is on the joint axis because there's no inversion eversion happening. We'll then move further down the foot, again pushing lateral, we're going to get eversion. Pushing medial, we're going to get inversion. At some point, we're going to get neither, and that is right there. So we can carry on doing several more points of that, but you only need two points to get a straight line so we can draw the joint axis to try and determine um, generally where it's positioned. This sort of um, position of the axis has significant implications um, for the type of orthoses and where we want the orthoses to push. We're also going to want to assess the alignment of the forefoot to the rear foot. So again, putting the subtalar joint in neutral, dorsiflexing the lateral side of the forefoot to resistance. We want to compare the plantar plane of the forefoot to a central bisection on the heel. Normally we'd expect those to be perpendicular um, or inverted or everted. Most people will be um, one or the other. The next test we're going to need to consider is ankle joint range of motion. So again, holding the, the foot approximately subtalar joint neutral, dorsiflexing the foot to resistance with the knee flexed and the knee extended. Traditionally we've accepted 10 degrees as normal, but again, variability from person to person is quite substantial.